Years ago, I had a teacher who had a saying, full-blown outcomes are the result of leading-edge events. The analogy he liked to use is if you take a very large rock and you throw it in the middle of a lake, that's the leading-edge event. What happens is that the rock will make waves, and the waves become the full-blown outcome that you see washing up on the shore. Or put it another way, the big things in life are made up of the little things, and when you look at what happened at Silicon Valley Bank over the weekend, and you look at it through that prism, everything starts to make sense. My name is Brian Trippett. I am your front porch conservative. Step on up to the electronic front porch, and let's talk. On Friday, March 10th, 2023, state regulators in California, and then ultimately regulators from the FDIC, came in and shut down Silicon Valley Bank. Up to that point, what had been a successful financial institution out on the West Coast. Over the weekend, there were lots of discussions about what to do. And these discussions were held between three different parties. The Fed, the U.S. Treasury, and the FDIC. Ultimately, it was decided late Sunday night that the FDIC would guarantee not just the normal accounts with about $250,000 in it, they would guarantee all the deposits at Silicon Valley Bank. This is a radical departure from what FDIC policy is. Some people will say it's a bank bailout, much like we had back in 2008. All right, that's debatable, but for sure, what was done is above the normal guarantee of the FDIC for $250,000 per uniquely titled account. We know what was done, but that sort of begs some questions. How did we get here? Or I should say, how did Silicon Valley Bank get here? And is this the best solution going forward? And what's going to happen next? Let's take a few moments and talk about all of those, shall we? So how does a financial institution go from being sound and respected to basically the equivalent of used toilet water. Well, it didn't happen overnight, and it turns out that this is one of those things that I mentioned earlier in the video. A whole bunch of leading edge events wind up being a big, full-blown outcome. By way of background, Silicon Valley Bank was founded back in 1983 and headquartered out of Santa Clara, California. And like a lot of financial institutions on the West Coast, it was very successful given where it was located. A lot of tech companies for clientele, venture capital companies, lots of deposit money, good relationships, sound, respected institution. Everything's going along great. Rounds about 2020, things were so good, in fact, that they had about $55 billion on the books for deposits at that bank. Yeah, and then everything was coming out post-pandemic and freewheeling and everything else. And before SVB knew what happened, they had $200 billion on the books at their financial institution. Now, there are all kinds of ways for banks to make money. The most common one that everybody's aware of is that, you know, banks will loan money. They set a certain interest rate for deposits. They set a certain interest rate for loans. The difference between the two is known as the spread. Depending on what the spread is, determines how much money that the bank makes. But Silicon Valley Bank had something of a unique problem. Most of their clients were much like them. They had no need of loan dollars. So now you've got all this money sitting on your books. What do you do with it? Well, if you can't loan it, the only other option at that point is to invest it. Now, under normal circumstances, SVB had a history of being very conservative with their investment policy. What they would do is they would do a lot of short-term securities, mortgage-backed obligations, that sort of thing, something you could turn around quick. That if they had to get their hands on it, okay, if they sell it, they might take a little bit of a loss, but nothing really bad. They could still have lots of you know, liquid money on hand if they absolutely had to get their hands on it in a pinch. Well, either because of the arrogance of time, the arrogance of the times, or just arrogance in general, somebody inside Silicon Valley Bank got the bright idea to take a significant amount of this money, 
that they had and start investing it in longer-term instruments, longer-term to the tune of about $120 billion in U.S. Treasuries, and then about $80 billion in 10-year mortgage obligation notes. Now, all of this is fine, provided three things. Number one, you have plenty of cash on hand if you need it. Number two, you can get your hands on cash fast if you've got to do it. And number three, interest rates don't start going up on you. Now, therein lies the problem for SVB. Beginning in about 2021, the Federal Reserve kept raising interest rates as a way to combat inflation. Well, I don't know much about investing, but this much I have figured out. There are certain investment instruments that are extremely sensitive to interest rate fluctuations, and one of them are treasuries. What could wind up happening is you could buy a treasury at one point, and here's the value of it. If interest rates go up, then if you had to sell that that commodity before it reaches maturity, you could wind up losing money on it. And in the end, that's what started happening to Silicon Valley Bank. In 2022, over the course of the year, the amount of deposit money that was supposed to come in to SVB kept going down and down and down. The bank, like every other financial institution, is required to keep a certain amount of money liquid. So, around about the beginning of this year, they decided that they would sell some treasuries that were about to come mature and other obligations that they had. Short-term instruments, I should say. It's probably a better way of phrasing it. Well, that's fine, but it didn't do everything they needed to do. And all of a sudden, everybody starts noticing, and everybody that is, including the customers, starts to notice that Silicon Valley Bank has about a $1.5 billion hole on their books. So they decide to get around that problem by selling some commodities, short-term stuff, profit the interest, you know, plug the hole. Well, the problem is they couldn't plug the hole, they couldn't make it work. Now, all this started up in earnest Wednesday. By Thursday morning, mutual customers at Silicon Valley Bank are kind of sending messages going, hey, are these guys okay? By Thursday afternoon, everybody's getting nervous because a lot of messages are going around asking the same question, except with a little more frantic uh, feel to it. Do we need to get out of here? Then Peter Thiel, the venture capitalist out on the West Coast, comes along and does the equivalent of a mic drop and says, I don't know about anybody else, but I think it's time to get out of here. And that's exactly what they did. People started calling for their money. Basically, the term is generally known as a bank run. By Friday morning, people are asking for money in earnest. Millions of dollars, billions of dollars. It got to the point by about Mid-morning or late morning, $44 billion had flown out the door. By the middle of the afternoon or the end of the afternoon, California regulators and then ultimately the FDIC right behind them came in and shut down SVB. A very sad tale. But you're probably sitting there wondering, well, why didn't the, the chief risk officer catch all this? And there's one little problem. For about eight months in 2022, they didn't have a chief risk officer. They only hired one in late 2022 or maybe in early 2023. So basically no one was minding the store. And the value of the bank didn't mind walking out the door. And all the deposits didn't mind walking out the door. And the customers didn't mind making sure their deposits walked out the door. So as I said earlier in the video, a solution was reached over the weekend the FDIC would guarantee deposits not just up to the normal $250,000 per uniquely titled account. They would guarantee every deposit at Silicon Valley Bank. Now, was that the right decision? Well, it sort of depends on who you ask. There are two schools of thought on it. I'll show you one side of it, and I'm going to show it to you from two different perspectives. I want to read a little bit of a of a tweet thread from U.S. Senator J.D. Vance, himself a venture capitalist. So he's got some experience in what was going on out there. And I'll read this straight from the thread. Many people smarter than me were worried about a bank run. Basically the idea of what happened on Friday happening everywhere. Everybody goes running to their bank trying to take out their deposits. 
to continue. That's certainly a risk worth preventing, but I don't know why preventing that risk required an SVB bailout. Yes, some SVB depositors did nothing wrong, full disclosure. Some businesses I invested in had deposits in SVB, so this statement is against interest. But many banked with SVB because of cheap venture debt or other services subsidized by SVB's risky business model. The idea that this won't be borne by taxpayers is also a joke. The inflated fees that every regional bank will be paid by tax-paying small banks and their tax-paying consumers. Those inflated fees are not incidental. They're what's paying for an expanded FDIC insurance. Finally, how is this letting the regulators off the hook? Good question. Particularly J.D. Vance and then also Mike Cernovich, uh, journalist, commentator. They're sort of the idea, yeah, we got, we sort of had to do this to prevent a bank run. All right, I get that. Cernovich takes it one step further, and I'll read you some of what he wrote. Uh, let, let all the small banks fail so that only three or four banks, all controlled by the same people, get to decide if gun stores get access to banking. You're all very smart people. Have you clearly thought this through? Cernovich's argument is, look, if we let, if this, if we just let this go under, which is one school of thought, then you're going to have a situation where forces, darker forces in some cases, would argue that we're going to start consolidating everything under three or four big banks, and then if you really think you don't like things now, they'll be even worse. So the two schools of thought are, we've got to bail them out to prevent something worse from happening, let them go under. I'm of the school of thought, I go back to what happened in 2008, which I think is what a lot of Americans are angry about. We came in and bailed out the banks in 2008 because of what happened with the mortgage crisis. Now we've got another major financial institution that's gone under, and it looks like we're on the hook for it. Well, the reality is we are on the hook for it. So do we let them go under, or do we try and bail them out, or backstop them, or whatever term you want to use, or as the title of this video says, a bank bailout by any other name is still just a bailout. I'm of the school of thought that says, Look, if their financial officers at the bank and the board of directors weren't smart enough to keep an eye on the store and mind things, they made bad decisions, let them go down. Yes, there will be consequences. No, I don't want to see it happen to everybody. No, I don't want to see a bank run. But sooner or later, this has got to stop. The idea that there are consequence-free actions and we are rewarding bad behavior, and that's exactly what we're doing here. I understand Cernovich's argument. The idea that if small banks start failing, everything gets consolidated, and then you're only dealing with three or four banks. To Cernovich and others of that mindset, I say this, it's going to happen anyway. Do you really think the forces that are going to make that happen are going to be deterred by the question of whether or not we bail out a bank or not? Bail them out? Don't bail them out. They're still going to try and push toward that idea. All right, if that's going to happen anyway, then I say we stand on principle. If the bank made a mistake, let the free market correct the problem. Let them go under and do not bail them out. And if you do, you only do it to the limit that the FDIC allows, $250,000 per titled account. These tech firms out in California who did most of their business with Silicon Valley Bank can find a way to make their operations work. The sun will come up tomorrow, believe it or not. As far as what's going to happen going forward, don't know yet. A lot of people are very nervous. They think this might be the beginning of hemorrhaging in the financial institutions. And I pray that's not the case. But there is one cautionary note that I will mention. And it's this. I've seen it floated around by a couple of different commentators. And having read what they've written, I can't say as I disagree with their analysis. They're worried, and I am equally as worried, that the Federal Reserve is going to look at what happened and misinterpret what it means. Keep in mind, what happened to Silicon Valley Bank was brought on in part due to the fact that the value of their assets were decreased by increasing interest rates. The Federal Reserve may look at that and go, hey, we can't have this kind of situation happen. These banks have got to have assets that are valuable. Well, keep in mind, the whole reason the Federal Reserve is trying to raise interest rates is to fight inflation. If they stop using the one and only weapon that they have available to them, control of the level of interest rates, then you could have a situation where inflation is hanging around a whole lot longer than it should. 
if they stop raising rates, and trust me, I don't want to see the rates raised for anybody. Americans are in enough debt right now without having to have any extra burden put on them. But the burden of inflation may be worse than the raising of the interest rates. But if you stop raising the interest rates, you can't get rid of the inflation. You can't wring it out of the economy. So I'm praying that the Federal Reserve reads this situation correctly. But those are my thoughts on it. What are yours? As we begin to wrap this up, I ask for a few favors, as I always do. Number one, if you're not a subscriber to this channel, please do so. I am a one-man band, and I'll take all the help I can get. So please, subscribe to the channel. Number two, smash the like button. A thumbs up is a big help to a new content creator. And number three, if you have friends of yours that you think would enjoy this content, please feel free to share this video around. My name is Brian Trippett. I'm your Front Porch Conservative, and I'll see you next time.